Good evening, everyone, and welcome to New York Gastroenterology Associates webinar. Today, we'll be talking about hemorrhoids, getting to the bottom of it. Uh, my name is Dr. Ugo Iroku, and I'm pleased to be here uh, with my two co-panelists, Dr. Dan Adler, who we'll get to hear from later on in the presentation, and Susie Finkel, our registered dietitian extraordinaire, who will also be presenting and fielding some of your questions regarding hemorrhoids and the treatment uh, of those. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started, okay? So I'm gonna share my screen here, hopefully successfully. Uh, to start off with, of course, we're gonna ask the question and hopefully answer uh, sufficiently, what are hemorrhoids? Um, they go by a, a number of names, depending on what part of the, the country you come from. Uh, sometimes they're just called rectal lumps, sometimes they're called piles. Uh, and you can feel them as lumps in the rectum. Uh, but the formal definition, of course, are the dilation and enlarged veins in the lower portion of the rectum or anus, okay? And this diagram helps to give you a view of what hemorrhoids look like um, uh, up close. So if you notice here, um, this purple uh, um, coloration here is meant to de depict external hemorrhoids. There are internal hemorrhoids that can exist as well, deeper into uh, the rectal canal. And sometimes those hemorrhoids can prolapse outwards and be seen outwards. So if you have bumps on the outside of the rectum, they could represent external or internal hemorrhoids. And we'll get into more detail about this anatomy in a few more slides as well. All right. So for those of you who want a little bit more detail, there are three major cushions of these hemorrhoidal veins that exist in the anal sphincter area. There's left lateral, so there's a big cushion to the left. And on the right side, there's right anterior and right posterior. So there are three major components where people can have internal um, hemorrhoids. And then there's some additional smaller uh, bundles of uh, veins or, or vessels between those two as well that can contain um, prominent hemorrhoids sometimes. Uh, about 10 million of us will have hemorrhoids. Uh, peak ages are age 45 to 65. Uh, the st stats show that for, eight, uh, for adults 50 years or older, you're 50% likely to have hemorrhoids. It's very common amongst many uh, um, stages of life, including pregnancy as well. So what causes hemorrhoids? It can ca be caused by many reasons, and we'll try to fly through some of these. For chronic trauma to the area, constipation and straining and the irritation to the area, diarrhea, similar constant irritation to that rectal area, sitting for a prolonged period of time, standing for a prolonged period of time, but especially sitting and occupations that involve that. Obesity adds to the risk, heavy lifting, pregnancy and aging as well, like we mentioned earlier. So these are a lot of words, but they're all just to say, uh, hemorrhoids can form by the swelling of the blood vessels that exist in the bottom of the rectal area. We all have these hemorrhoidal veins, every human being does, these labyrinth, these plexus of blood vessels. And we call it hemorrhoids when these blood vessels get swollen and dilated. Chronic straining again to the area with the constipation and diarrhea, like we mentioned, can cause trauma and cause inflammation and can cause swelling. And these cushions um, of blood vessels, like I mentioned before, can sometimes detach from the, the area to, of the rectal wall that they're tacked to and actually prolapse downward towards the total pool. So they're swollen and they have the risk of leaving our body, prolapsing and moving outwards towards uh, the rectum annual area. All right. Um, and then as you have continued trauma to these blood vessels, that's what leads to bleeding. These blood vessels have blood, of course, on the inside. And so the more trauma you have to these um, cushions of blood vessels that exist at the bottom of the rectum, the more likely you are to have bleeding in the area, right? Uh, so this um, is another pictorial depiction of internal um, hemorrhoids. Um, this line here represents what we call the dentate line. And um, anything, that originates above the dentate line represents internal hemorrhoids. When it's below that, it represents external hemorrhoids. What's one key significant difference between the two? 
Uh, hemorrhoids um, above the dentate line um, tends not to be in a very tender place. The nerve innervation above the dentate line is very sparse, uh, and so it's not as painful. When you have hemorrhoids or intervention to the hemorrhoids below the dentate line, they're very significantly, they can be painful at times. And so we manage that appropriately in the way we treat uh, external hemorrhoids. All right, so when it comes to hem internal hemorrhoids, you might've heard of different classes of internal hemorrhoids. And just to quick, quickly walk you through that, class one is typical, typically where you have the internal hemorrhoids and it's in place, it is not prolapsed. Type two, grade two is when uh, the hemorrhoids can um, prolapse, so leave their anal canal and be seen on the outside, but then it spontaneously goes back. Uh, grade three is where it is prolapsed, but then it's stuck there, and it only goes back if you push it back in, you or your physician pushes it back in. And grade four internal hemorrhoids are when it prolapses and you cannot get it back in. And so these are different grades of the severity of hemorrhoids that, um, internal hemorrhoids that we have to treat from time to time. All right, what are the symptoms of hemorrhoids? We know those it could be bleeding, uh, red blood in the stool, pain with bowel movements, that itchiness, difficult hygiene, a sense of um, you know incontinence or spearing in the underwear, um, the prolapse, like I mentioned, of rectal tissue leakage as well, and then thrombosis, which is where you have some clot formation in the blood vessels there, right? So we can skip over these as well in the interest of time. So when it comes again to hemorrhoids, we as physicians like to do what we call, um, have what we call a differential diagnosis. And what does that mean? It means that even as we're considering that your symptoms may be hemorrhoids, we're also thinking about some other disorders that could present in similar ways. When you come in with your severe pain that recently started, we don't just consider hemorrhoids, we also wonder whether or not it's a fissure, a little tear to the area, an abscess, a fistula, a burrowing tunnel caused by underlying disease, or a thrombosed hemorrhoid, a little clot formation in those hemorrhoids. Sometimes the pain is chronic. Again, we're thinking about more and more things depending on which symptoms you have. And so we're never just assuming it's hemorrhoids, um, but we always wanna keep it our, our, a differential diagnosis, an open mind, to the other things that might be causing similar symptoms. And so if you do have chronic pain, bleeding, itchiness, discharge, and a lump to the area, don't be surprised if at some point your doctor, if these symptoms are not resolving, would like to do a few more additional tests to make sure there's nothing more severe going on. All right, so don't be surprised. Again, we normally have you in uh, the left, lying on your left side and examine the area. On the outside, we want to look to see if there are any telltale rashes or skin tags, any evidence of fissures, so injury to the rect rectal anal area, any abscesses, evidence of abscesses or, or drainage to the area. We want to make sure your sphincter is functioning properly when we do our rectal exam. That's one of the things we're feeling for, and we want to make sure there's no sign of tumors there. All right, and we're gonna go into what are some of the treatment options as well uh, for our internal and external uh, hemorrhoids. Again, we're lucky enough to have uh, Susie Finkel on the line here. So she will, um, at the end of my talk, go into deeper detail about really what's the mainstay of treatment for hemorrhoids, which is the dietary management. So we'll fly through some of those dietary slides, but there are also some other approaches that we will address as well, All right? And so um, as she'll go into, fiber is a major component of the diet. And again, I'll fly through my slides because she'll go into all of this in detail. Um, you already know that you should be getting about 20 to 30 grams at least of fiber in your, in your daily diet, supplemented if your diet is not sufficient. Uh, we'll go over insoluble and soluble fibers. Um, and, um, but one other component of the first line therapy is making sure you're practicing proper bowel movement habits. So um, uh, one important thing um, is to avoid straining. And that's in some, way, in some ways a lot of the reasons why we give you a high fiber diet and recommend you do a lot of fluid intake so that when you're sitting down, you're able to move your bowels promptly. Sitting in that position, in the seated position, 
favors the pooling of blood in those hemorrhoidal veins, as you can imagine, just from the anatomy I showed you earlier. And so we want you to have bowel movements that don't require you to stay on the toilet bowl for a prolonged period of time, don't cause a lot of constipation and straining and irritation to those hemorrhoidal veins, and don't lead to other complications like bleeding. All right. All right, so there are also um, additional non-surgical options that we use when the dietary methods, when you're drinking fluids, when you're um, practicing proper um, bathroom hygiene is not working. There are over-the-counter creams and suppositories that contain hydrocortisone. These are designed to reduce the inflammation that are going on in those hemorrhoidal areas. We'd like you to keep, of course, that area very clean. Um, there are sits baths available, of course, over the counter. We want to make sure that area um, is nice and clean. And if you need to use a sits bath, um, those, that's an over-the-counter option for cleaning and soaking that area for relief. And for some uh, uh, people uh, who have severe pain and discomfort in their area and have a clot formed, while you're waiting for um, treatment of that, uh, sometimes even compresses, um, cold compresses can be of some relief. But again, um, coming to see your doctor so we can definitively treat this is really the primary method of management. Um, like I mentioned, if you have a, a hemorrhoid uh, that's internal, that's popped out, you can see whether or not you can gently push it back in. If you meet great resistance, of course, we don't want you to injure yourself, so do no further uh, pressure. But if you can, it's okay to gently reduce to move back in hemorrhoids if they popped out. Um, and like I mentioned, sits backs, tuck swipes, these are all options, over-the-counter options for treating the area for comfort and cleanliness. All right, so when it comes to further management, what are some additional treatments we have to offer for our patients who come in with varying grades of hemorrhoidal stages, especially internal hemorrhoids? We'll start with that. So internal hemorrhoids, again, because um, you know, they don't have, they're not very sensitive in that area above the dentate line, there are more things we can do to treat you and to get your hemorrhoids feeling better um, in the office. Again, when it comes to grade one hemorrhoids that are in place, they're not popping outwards, we'll always start with talking to you about high fiber, a lot of fluids, and then there are additional uh, therapies including rubber band therapy, sclerotherapy, and even um, infrared coagulation that we bring to bear. Um, the more severe of a grade of internal hemorrhoids you have, the more we bring in these additional words that likely will be referring you to the surgeon to help us manage the hemorrhoidal plexi, um, and then also um, staple and excisional hemorrhoidal plexi options. And we'll go into more details uh, of these uh, words in a few slides. All right, so just uh, moving along, um, again, like I mentioned, um, uh, one option we have for treatment is the rubber band ligation. Uh, this is a treatment um, that often we, um, uh, we refer to our surgical friends for treatment of more severe internal um, hemorrhoids, or if there's conditions where they have both internal and external, Sometimes our surgical allies will help um, manage these um, um, uh, um, hem types of hemorrhoids. And what does it mean to undergo a rubber band ligation? It really is exactly contained in the, the phrase. So the rubber band is what's used to um, kind of tie off the blood vessels that would form the hemorrhoids. And ligation just means the tying off. So rubber band ligation just refers to the fact that these small rubber bands are deployed on the inside um, to the internal hemorrhoids um, that are problematic to prevent them from swelling and to ultimately um, uh, cause that hemorrhoid to fall off. Then the ulcer that's formed after the hemorrhoid falls off, um, scars over, and even that scarring process helps to prevent any further swelling of uh, the hemorrhoid in that particular area. It kind of tacks, it pushes the uh, blood vessels to the re rectal wall, preventing recurrence. All right, and I think I just um, um, said it's it's successful in a large fraction of patients, two thirds to three quarters of patients um, will find success uh, full treatment with rubber band ligation. Um, the 
the truth uh, uh, in advertising is that yes, there can sometimes be some pain in people who undergo rubber band ligation. And the reason why is again, it's, it's an aggressive therapy. It's meant to fall above the dentate line, which as you remember is the area of the rectum that does not have the nerves. But every now and then there can be some tautness or some um, still some pressure that is felt by the um, nerve endings that begin lower down in the anal canal, and that can be interpreted as pain. Usually our surgical colleagues um, try to assess as to whether or not the deployed band is causing or the pain, assess whether or not the band is causing pain before they finally deploy it. Uh, and so if they notice that they're on the examination table that you're having pain, uh, they'll they'll take it off and reposition it before they finally deploy it, right? Um, and usually people are able to get back to work right away. You might have a feeling of, of some sort of sense of difference in the emptying of your bowels subsequently. Um, and then typically um, they don't like to use this if you're on a blood thinner. All right, and so hopefully you've either have eaten your dinner already or you're far from it, but you can tolerate this picture a little bit. But for those of you who can tolerate the, the graphic nature of it and want a little bit more details to what it looks like, uh, yes, that left side of the image shows them accessing uh, the internal hemorrhoids. Um, and then the right side shows that if you can make out that um, band that's deployed and is now um, uh, helping to, uh, in a sense, uh, cut off that blood vessel that was causing the hemorrhoid and swelling over time. Um, the hemorrhoid falls off over the next five to seven days, and you just have an ulcer that continues to heal up after that without, without difficulty. All right. Um, typically, um, you might have gone to see a surgeon or a colleague, and uh, you might have been surprised that they didn't treat the left lateral, the right anterior, the right posterior, all the cushions of your internal hemorrhoids all at once. And that is correct and typical. Typically, they'll go after one or two columns per visit. Um, that's um, uh, safer and uh, more tolerable uh, for a single visit. Uh, and so um, that's uh, entirely appropriate if that's the approach that your doctor uh, took. All right, um, there, we do note, uh, of course, that because every human being has these hemorrhoidal veins that exist at the bottom of the rectum, there is always a recurrence rate pop, a probability, and it can be as high as 68%. However, that's looking out five years into the future. In the short term, these treatments are very effective. But yes, can you potentially need a recurrent treatment in the future? The answer is yes. Um, for people who, have, who need multiple treatments, of course, they might undergo multiple treatments in a given year as well. Um, and the good news is that uh, speaking to the uh, efficacy of this option, only five to 10% of patients need a more aggressive surgical approach to the hemorrhoid care who are sent for the rubber band ligation. All right, and again, this is just digging into um, the possible complications. Again, um, um, just looking at the fine print. Yes, um, there's a possibility of pain. Again, in better hands, the numbers are even better than this, but this is all comers across the country. Um, there is a very, very rare risk of infection in that area. And there is about a 1% chance of bleeding in that area in studies that have been done. All right, and so uh, when it comes to office uh, infrared coagulation, this is an option that many of you have had the opportunity to have had performed um, at, our, um, uh, at our offices in Midtown or in the Brooklyn office as of right now. Um, the way this works is that we are, again, treating those hemorrhoidal veins on the inside to treat um, the blood vessels that are leading to the internal hem hemorrhoids to make them less likely to be prominent. All right, so we're generating an infrared uh, radiation, which essentially um, clots off the blood vessels and the blood vessels um, leading to the, the hemorrhoids. It's most be beneficial in your grade one, grade two internal hemorrhoids, the more severe the hemorrhoids are, uh, sometimes, again, we'll see whether or not we think you need um, more aggressive therapy like with the rubber band ligation. And uh, we will do a number of applications right there and then. We usually do try to treat um, circumferentially. Um, uh, so throughout the whole area, all, all cushions uh, with our treatment. Um, and But of course, um, the more 
um, if they're very prominent, sometimes there is a risk of pain, but I would say that the risk of uh, discomfort is almost minimal, especially in better hands. And uh, our patients, I think, will largely attest to the fact that they're able to get back to work the same day, uh, largely without any difficulty at all. The only discomfort being during the actual exam itself, which may feel a bit like a rectal exam, but beyond that, they feel fine. All right, this graphic just tries to give you a little bit of an imaging of what we're actually doing. Again, we apply our probe on the inside of uh, the rectum and we're treating the area um, above that dentate line that represents the origin of the internal hemorrhoids. Again, treating it and making it less likely um, to, or actually shrinking it. Um, it should be noted that the effect of our the infrared coagulation progresses over time. So we treat you on one day and with every passing day, the, the um, the, the, the clotting off and the, the sclerosing is the term of the blood vessels leading to those blood um, hemorrhoids increases over time so that it becomes more and more efficacious with every passing day, less and less likely that you'll have your symptoms that you came in with. All right, and our recent um, randomized controlled trials have shown that our infrared coagulation is just as efficacious, just as powerful as um, the banding techniques um, on the order of about 81% symptom control um, in, in general and in, in all comers. So that's great news for our patients as well. All right, and uh, there are additional options that you might have heard of. I'm just gonna um, uh, go through these quickly. There's something called office sclerotherapy that was used more in the past. This involves injecting a needle into that uh, internal hem uh, hemorrhoid area to have uh, with you know, a number of sclerosing agents, including phenol or sodium tetradecyl sulfate, with the idea, again, like the infrared coagulation of sclerosing, uh, you know, cutting off those blood vessels that cause the hemorrhoids. We find in general that patients tolerate our infrared coagulation option better. And so um, in our office, we don't offer the sclerotherapy option, but that's something you should be aware of just in case you hear of that. All right, now, of course, for people who have persistent symptoms, um, whether it's the itchiness, um, bleeding, pain, blood clots, infections, or external hemorrhoid involvement, um, sometimes it is time to proceed to, to the surgeon to get more surgical therapy called hemorrhoidectomy, of course. What are the risks? Of course, you now have to deal with anesthesia. There's always a risk of bleeding, infection, and scarring of the area. Um, due to surgery, but these are risks. Uh, usually um, patients have great outcomes when they need surgical um, management. Um, there are a number of different types of surgical options and we'll go through some of these quickly. Um, uh, it, uh, one very common uh, situation is that of a thrombos hemorrhoid that I wanted to go over as well. So for patients who have an external hemorrhoid, you have to remember that on the inside of these blood vessels are is blood and blood can clot and and we call that a thrombosed hemorrhoid and when you have a thrombosed hemorrhoid it can be very painful um, you know very tender to touch um, present as a, a very um, inflamed and uh, tender mass um, and um, in general uh, we like to have you come in to report these to us within 72 hours so that we can get you plugged in with our surgical out, um, colleagues, so that they can actually excise, take out um, the, the, the clot that's formed um, and make sure that um, you're not suffering in pain. Sometimes people do sit through, you know, their external hemorrhoids or just kind of bear through it. Um, and in those cases, sometimes um, they just continue to um, find that their symptoms gradually dissipate. There are some surgeons who after the 72 hour mark will not proceed uh, to try to do um, it's the, um, um, the treatment of the, the thromboids, uh, thrombos and hemorrhoids. I will just manage people conservatively, but um, every um, um, doctor manages these a little differently. So if you have pain, don't suffer at home, come see us right away because there is a time component um, that's involved in managing these as well. All right, of course, we don't want you to undergo any complications like necrosis, which is when your, the tissue around the area is not receiving adequate amount of blood supply. 
All right, let me try to speed this up so we um, get to cover everything. Um, yes, there's some complications with more aggressive uh, ther uh, therapeutic options um, involving both your uh, genital urinary tract, bleeding, um, stricture, infection, and rarely constipation, incontinence. So um, uh, yes, for people who require more aggressive surgeries, there are some risks, but again, in better hands, we're seeing excellent outcomes, all right? But in general, of course, we'd prefer you uh, get to prevent um, uh, all these uh, complications and never get a chance to see us. <laughs> uh, and so how can you do that? You wanna make sure you're getting your 25 uh, grams of fiber if you're um, a female or 35 plus grams of fiber as a male. A lot of fluids, six to eight glasses of water. Again, we'll go into more detail with that. We wanna make sure you're exercising, keeping your bowels moving um, perfectly. Avoid long periods of standing or sitting, especially sitting, including on the toilet bowl that can cause a pooling of blood in the hemorrhoidal area. Don't strain, that causes irritation. That's not the way uh, you want to move your bowels. And go as soon as you feel the urge because part of what your colon does is to, is to um, convert the liquid stool that starts up in the beginning of the colon, the colon dries it out to the form where it's solid stool ready to go to the toilet bowl. So when you leave um, stool in your colon, your colon just continues to dry out whatever is there. And so the longer you leave it there, the more likely it is to be constipated and cause straining uh, and then in irritation and inflammation on the way out. All right, so I think that's the end of my section of this presentation. And so now we will bring on the amazing Susie Finkel for part two. Thank you. And I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, so now we've learned so many details, very, very, all, the, all, all, all of the details you'd probably be wondering about the hemorrhoid situation and, and anatomy. I learned a lot, um, even from the technical pieces there. So really good to know. Um, and if you're wondering about how diet can impact this, um, you know, we really want to just think about on the most basic level that what goes in us comes out of us. And, you know, if you're a parent of a human or maybe an animal, you've probably done some inspection of fecal matter and realized that a bit more than inspecting your own stool. But you can see evidence of previous meals sometimes, and particularly when that meal contains some plant fiber, which I'm going to um, talk a bunch about for a few minutes. But the big concept here is really that what we eat has the ability to affect our stool texture and the ease of evacuation and stool hygiene. And that in turn can affect hemorrhoids, you know, in terms of active hemorrhoids and hemorrhoid prevention. Um, and so you may have seen this stool chart here. Um, if you're an NYGA patient, the Bristol stool chart can be uh, very famous around here. And what it shows is some different stool outcomes, if you will. Um, you know, so type one all the way at the top to type seven all the way at the bottom, we see two ends of um, the poop pendulum. That's what I'll, I'll call it. And basically, you know, being at either end, either extreme of that pendulum is something that can aggravate hemorrhoids. Um, you know, hemorrhoids are often associated with constipation and chronic straining, but hyperdefecation and loose bowel movements can also cause issues. And so what we really wanna focus on is how we can treat those problems dietarily, but also if there's something in your diet that is causing a sort of suboptimal poop scenario. And so one primary tool in someone's diet that can help with hemorrhoids is fiber. So you may have heard, you know, eat more fiber. Um, and that's because, you know, fiber can really affect the texture of our stool. Um, but there's a little more nuance than just eat more fiber. We want to customize it a little bit depending on what's going on. Um, so fiber is a component of plant foods and the body doesn't fully digest it. Um, and therefore it arrives intact in the colon and then gets excreted. So it plays this important part in the structure of the stool and its ultimate landing place or kind of death place, I call it, is the toilet. You know, it's not meant to live in us. It's going to come out. And if you've listened to, to some past webinars of ours, um, you might already know a couple of facts about fiber. There's 
two main types. We have um, you know, dietary fiber that can be soluble, which gels with water, and then insoluble fiber, which does not dissolve in water. And these fiber forms affect the texture of your stool, and they can also affect the speed of the contents moving through your bowels. Soluble fiber turns into a kind of jello type texture and can work to actually consolidate sort of fragmented pieces of stool. Um, it can kind of slow things down in the bowels, whereas insoluble fiber adds more of a coarse bulk and it can be stimulating to speed up evacuation. So if you have active hemorrhoids, we can leverage certain fiber types to manage a suboptimal stool texture or bowel movement frequency, right? To help give um, those blood vessels some relief. But we can also use fiber as a preventative tool to keep you regular in the bathroom and avoid hemorrhoid risk. So just to talk about some um, scenarios that can aggravate or lead to hemorrhoids, one kind of umbrella category is having diarrhea, loose or urgent stools, um, excessive evacuation through the day, right? Anything that causes us to spend a lot of time on the toilet or excessive wiping can be that hemorrhoid risk or agitator. So if this describes something that's going on with you, foods that are rich in soluble fiber are a great starting place because they can absorb excess water in the bowels without being overly stimulating. You know, think of a soft kind of slug moving through rather than lots of insoluble or aggressive roughage that's pressing on the colon walls and then coming out of your anus. Soluble fiber rich foods include oats and barley, as well as the flesh of sweet potato, avocado, carrots, and um, winter squashes. So, you know, skinless fleshy fruits are also great. These are all smooth, soft textures with a nice gelling capacity. Um, and if you eat insoluble fiber, changing the texture of that fiber can be a helpful modification too to make it less abrasive. So for example, taking nuts um, and thinking more so towards the smooth nut butter version of it or um, pureed beans instead of whole beans, um, smoothies, you know, things like berries or kale and so on. Um, and so that's sort of a texture piece that we can play with. Um, but if you're having chronic diarrhea or urgency, we also want to consider if there's a dietary factor that's driving that pattern. You know, many different dietary issues can cause that abnormality in the stool pattern. And so um, this is where dietitians come in to work with a patient to investigate the possibilities here, such as malabsorbing something like a sugar, you know, lactose intolerance or fructose intolerance. Um, if that's causing diarrhea for you every day, that's something that we want to be able to identify. Um, other things like a food chemical intolerance, there's something called histamine intolerance that can cause um, some pretty disruptive changes to, to bowel movements, um, triggers of IBSD, IBS with diarrhea. Um, sometimes that can be fatty foods, spicy foods, those can vary for individuals and we want to kind of identify what the pattern is for you. So variety of drivers of the issue, um, something we want to do some detective work on. So other kind of big umbrella category here, constipation, um, infrequency, hard stools, straining, right? All these things can be associated. Um, your fiber plan might look a little bit different to balance both fiber types, soluble and insoluble. We, we like a, a, a nice balance here of both. So insoluble fiber, like leafy greens and berries, you know, those are the examples um, in, in this case, but there's lots of different forms, um, nuts and seeds, many different, different types of um, foods with, with mostly insoluble fiber, but these can stimulate the colon walls and that can kind of trigger some emptying and keep things moving. Um, but a diet of only insoluble fiber, right? A lot of this kind of roughage would produce potentially lots of small, hard or stringy pieces of stool rather than something consolidated. So soluble fiber plays this important role here because it can kind of gel everything together and make it easier to pass. With active hemorrhoids, that's particularly helpful, right? We want something that's soft, well-formed, easy to pass, um, and also preventing straining. So we want it to come out without um, you know, too much struggle. 
So soluble fiber, because it holds moisture, it's a great tool for diarrhea, right? As I mentioned, but it can also be this preventative tool for constipation or pebble-like stool. Um, but important note here is that if you have active constipation, you might wanna consider um, a supportive laxative regimen to evacuate a stool buildup, right? It's been a while since you've gone um, before adding a bunch of fiber or else you can kind of further back yourself up, you know, adding more, more uh, bulk here to a traffic jam can make things worse and potentially aggravate that pressure. Um, so really want to clear out a potential big stool burden and then really gradually adding fiber of these different types so you can get used to it. And so just kind of quickly, um, Dr. Roku mentioned some, some tools that we have, right, that are home remedies and over-the-counter options. But um, alongside changes to our food, and especially when diet alone is not producing an optimal stool texture or frequency, over-the-counter supplements can work some magic to create a more comfortable ex toileting experience. Um, fiber supplements that can help to consolidate stool and add salt, soft bulk um, really can be helpful, you know, help to wipe clean and really have something that's um, a more optimal texture if we kind of can't achieve that through some diet change or, or food texture change alone. Um, so these are products like Citrusel, that's you know, a pure soluble fiber product um, or more absorptive products, um, bulking agents like psyllium husk and Fibercon are ones that we use quite often. Um, laxatives and stool softeners may also be helpful, you know, depending on what's going on for you. Um, if there's an underlying constipation or an evacuation issue, like a pelvic floor dysfunction or a motility issue, um, we might incorporate those as well. Um, and finally, thinking about the, the pooping environment, right, um, that should not be overlooked. Um, I don't mean like uh, lighting candles, but I don't, I don't see why not, but more so like a to the toileting position is a really important thing to think about, setting yourself self up for easy passage. Um, elevating your feet is a really important part of that, having your knees kind of at this 60 degree angle so that you're more anatomically appropriate um, at, this, at this position to... Um, to get a, a stool out. And so um, you'll see in this picture here, that's um, there's these pr products that we that are common called squatty potties, but you can really use anything. You can use a stack of books. You can flip over a trash can, um, lots of different ways to get in that position. And over the toilet bidet attachments or sprayer attachments, um, those can frankly be life-changing because you're reducing wiping um, and you're reducing that potential irritation. Um, and saving some, some toilet paper use too. So not, not a bad thing. They're relatively inexpensive. Um, so consider that supportive bowel regimen for hemorrhoid management and prevention. Um, and I think we'll move on with some questions now. Great. So um, welcome everyone. This is the time where you're welcome to jump in <clears throat> with questions in the chat um, area. Uh, so you can just click on chat and um, type in your questions and we'll make sure our panel gets to that. And while uh, the questions are coming in, I have a question I'm gonna pose to you, uh, Dr. Dan Adler. Uh, so uh, when uh, should a person who has frequent blood in the stool and they call it, you know, they say it's from hemorrhoids and maybe their primary doctor says it's from hemorrhoids and it's year zero, it's year one, it's year two, and it's the same thing, there's blood in the stool. At what point should they start getting concerned that there is something else or could be something else? How do you manage that in your office? It's a great question. So certainly before too many years click by, a lot of um, blood in the stool, of course, is very uh, common, and it's very easy to jump to a conclusion that this is coming from hemorrhoids without really investigation. A lot of this goes by age and symptoms. For young people, pregnant women who've recently delivered, guys who go to the gym and lift heavy weights, those are good indicators that they may. But the most important thing is to really get an examination. What I do when I take a look inside is that 
if clearly hemorrhoids are inflamed, angry looking, we see that they've recently bled, I feel comfortable most of the time treating the hemorrhoids with the caveat that if symptoms do not go away as prescribed, it's very important that patients be back in touch with us within a few weeks after treatment. And we are unfortunately seeing colon polyps and colon cancers in younger and younger people. That is not to scare people, but the majority of the time this is hemorrhoids, but you need to sort of have uh, a good nose for when the next step should be taken. So at the end of a hemorrhoid treatment, I always tell my patients that if they're doing everything right and their bowel, bowel movements are soft and well-regulated and they continue to see bleeding, they must reach back to us and we decide whether it's appropriate to get a colonoscopy and look further into the colon. Not so much to look for hemorrhoids because we know they were already there, but it's to make sure there isn't anything else going on that can mimic the same kind of bleeding that we see with hemorrhoids. Obviously for older and middle-aged people, if let's say someone's 45 or 50 and they've never had a colonoscopy before, they are overdue and the colon needs to be checked. Great, excellent answer. All right, Susie, this one's for you. Um, I've seen recent information that fiber reduction is better for constipation than increasing fiber. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, you know, so we, with, with fiber, just like stool, we don't really want to be at either end of the spectrum. You know, we don't want to have a no fiber diet. We also don't want to have a diet that's um, excessive in fiber if there's constipation going on. And so, you know, we really like a balance of those fiber types, insoluble, which doesn't gel with water, insoluble with gels with water, but depending on the nature of the constipation, right? There's like different sort of thing, forms of stool that can be happening with constipation. Um, we're gonna customize the fiber a bit. So if it's constipation where you're letting out really small pieces of stool at a time, you know, sort of pebble-like stool, we like so this soluble, you know, kind of bulking fiber because it's gonna hydrate the stool and actually help, help to sort of sew that together. Um, but if you're not going for days at a time and we just kind of add a, a bunch of fiber at once and you have fiber in your diet, that could further back you up. So it can kind of depend what your baseline is, right? If you have a high fiber diet, then you know, the answer may not be to add more fiber. If you have a no fiber diet, we certainly want to add some fiber. We want to have some bulk to the stool. So it's important that there's soft structure, but it is going to depend a little bit about what your baseline diet looks like and what the, the pattern of constipation is for you. Excellent. All right, next question for you, Dr. Adler. Uh, this uh, a patient wants to know, how long should I try suppositories and other over-the-counter options before I give up and come into my doctor or gastroenterologist? So the answer, I think, is a few weeks. Um, hemorrhoids, and no matter what you do for them, nature takes a bit of course and takes time to calm down. And you can't expect to use suppositories for two days and have a miracle. It just doesn't occur that quickly. But certainly, if a month, six weeks goes by and you've diligent and done everything you need to do, and if your symptoms are there, then it's time to get an opinion. Okay, great. This question goes, uh, please discuss the role of meat in the diet and hemorrhoids. I've noticed that it toughens my stool up immediately. Yeah, so, you know, meat, and we could even lump in proteins here in general, you know, things like fish and eggs, um, don't necessarily cause constipation or um, cause a sort of, tough stool, but without fiber, it means that they're not really providing any structure, you know? So when they reach the colon, they can almost be um, something that is just, you know, a, a very structureless mass, right? There's nothing that kind of hold, holds it together. So it can really depend on what you're pairing with that meat, right? Like a, a plate of steak or a plate of fish on its own um, is not going to have kind of anything to help to give it um, a nice structure that's easy to pass. So you might want to think about balancing it 
with fiber on on the plate. So here we're looking for um, you know a little bit a little bit of of both plant foods and and the protein to go together. Great. All right. This question is. Should I come in for an exam if I know I have stage two hemorrhoids and they feel manageable to me? So I think it's a question of how do you know that you have stage two hemorrhoids? And if you've previously been examined and you feel that the advice that you've gotten has been good and what's recommended is working, the answer is no. If you're guessing that you have stage two hemorrhoids, then absolutely you need some professional eyes on it. Great. Uh, Susie, this question is, how does a low FODMAP diet affect hemorrhoids? Yeah, so, you know, a low, a low FODMAP diet is something that reduces um, these certain types of plant foods with what we call fermentable carbohydrates. And for people that are sensitive to FODMAPs, right? So hopefully you're not somewhat, you're not, um, following a low FODMAP diet just for fun, but, but it's because you suspect that these are affecting um, you with some gastrointestinal symptoms and maybe changing bowel patterns. Um, someone that may be sensitive to FODMAPs or is exploring whether they're sensitive to FODMAPs might find that eating those foods um, can affect um, you know, bowel patterns, right? When you eat certain FODMAP rich foods that might lead to diarrhea or it could lead to constipation. And when we cut those foods out, you know, occasionally on these low FODMAP diets, people accidentally, you know, unintentionally um, end up being low fiber because they're avoiding lots of these plant foods that could be rich in FODMAP. So we really want to make sure that you have still a good range of some fruit and some vegetables and you're not becoming overly avoidant of plant foods because there's a variety of plant foods that are rich in FODMAPs. Um, and so, and to, to circle back to the hemorrhoid piece, right? So if, you, if you're if you eating low fiber unintentionally, perhaps on a low FODMAP diet, um, you could end up with some constipation or some straining or some stool abnormalities unintentionally. So important that you have some support there just to make sure you're eating kind of a well-balanced, in a well-balanced way. Excellent. The questions are pouring in and we'll get through as many as, as we can. All right. So this question is, <clears throat> is colase clear, that's docusate, a laxative, and please compare colase to Miralax and how many days in a row should you take either? Uh, Dan, you want to feel that one? Sure. So docusate is actually not a laxative. It's actually something that's, um, we call it a surfactant. It actually is um, almost uh, a, a type of a soap. And what it does is it actually stays within the uh, gut. It is not absorbed into the bloodstream. And what it does is it attracts water and helps it mix with the stool essentially as a lubricant. And it could be very helpful in terms of changing the, the quality of it. Um, it's a very safe long-term medication to be used because it's not absorbed into the bloodstream. And if it's effective for you, it's uh, you know, potentially a way to go. Miralax, on the other hand, is actually a laxative. And what it does is it absorbs and actually causes a net increase of water to flow into the gut in the small bowel and colon. It's also a very, very good, safe product, not a first choice for long-term help unsupervised. I think that it's a reasonable thing to try as an off-the-shelf product for a little bit. But if you find that you constantly need to resort to a laxative, again, you should see your gastroenterologist for a real diagnosis and some more definitive help. Great. All right, this question is for you, um, Susie. Um, I've heard that uh, uh, the six to eight glasses of water doesn't apply to everyone. How do I know how much water I should really be consuming on a daily basis? Yeah, favorite thing, the pee test. You're looking at the color of your urine. Um, you know, you really want it to be in that sort of lighter lemonade color. Doesn't have to be perfectly clear, but lighter yellow. We're not looking for kind of an, an amber range. Um, and that is something that's gonna vary for individuals. It's gonna vary on, you know, how much you 
uh, lose in the day. If you sweat, if you work out, depending on the season, um, you know, so just hydrate until your, until your urine's looking like that yet light yellow. Great. Does bicycle riding contribute to hemorrhoids, especially long hours of it? So no, so, so not on its own, right? Biking doesn't necessarily cause hemorrhoids, but you know, if you have an active, active hemorrhoid, that friction can cause irritation and the sweat can also add to that, right? So keeping that area um, somewhat dry can make things more comfortable. And Dr. Adler looks like he's back. So if you have anything to add there. Yeah, the question was, does um, extended hours of bike riding aggravate hemorrhoids? Sure, it, it potentially can. Um, but I always take exercise over hemorrhoids. So <laughs> continue with your bike riding and do what you need to do to treat the hemorrhoids. That's right. I, I love that answer. That's perfect. All right. Um, um, padded shorts and padded bike seats. And um, maybe this person knows that sounds like they're an avid biker, but those can make the situation more comfortable. Right. And I'll, I'll also add to shower up and clean and dry the area, um, you know, in the saddle area where you've been sitting down after a hard, hard workup. So you don't walk around with the salt and sweat you know, in the area for a long time after you finish cycling. Great. All right, we have five more minutes for questions. We'll get in as many as possible. <clears throat> uh, this question is, uh, hi, uh, let's see here actually. Um, could you talk about the long-term use of magnesium oxide 400 milligrams a day? Yeah, all right. Dr. Allen, do you want, do, do you want, should I answer that or either of us? Go ahead, start off. Okay. Um, so, you know, generally very safe. Um, you know, I think one of the main things to consider is the health of your kidneys. If you have well-functioning kidneys, um, you're pretty good to, to take that long-term. It can be a very effective, um, os we call them osmotic laxatives. They kind of gently draw water into the colon and we like magnesium very much in our practice. Great. All right, um, next question is, um, this was regarding, oh yeah. Does the doctor examine hemorrhoids while performing a colonoscopy? How often would you recommend an anal hemorrhoid examination if there are no severe symptoms? So a two-parter. So the answer is yes, hemorrhoids are always examined at the time of um, colonoscopy. Hemorrhoids are actually a part of the uh, most distal or lower colon. And we always make note on a colon report what we see. Um, it's an interesting time to examine hemorrhoids in the sense that after your colon prep, we always see hemorrhoids a little bit irritated. Now we, we gauge this, what's normal irritation versus abnormal irritation, whether or not there's active bleeding at the time, but yes, they are examined. And in answer to the second part of the question, I think that um, if someone is having absolutely no hemorrhoid symptoms, then there really isn't a reason to get a hemorrhoid exam um, on top of it. Excellent. All right. Um, how many caplets of citrusel should you take daily for regularity? Um, and caplets are more convenient than spoonfuls to this uh, attendee. <laughs> The standard serving of citrus cell, standard dose, um, is four of the of these little tablets, and that's often effective. It's really going to be, you know, there's there's not an equation for it. We do individualize the amount of a fiber supplement for people. Um, you can always start with a smaller amount, see if you notice a difference and add more. Um, but, you know, four, four tablets often at night, because we're sort of targeting a morning bowel, bowel movement where uh, many adults have their most, you know, um, sensitive, active time in the morning. Um, that would be a good, a good starting place. Great. What should you do if you are young, 35 to 40, a male who lifts weights and gets external hemorrhoids, no bleeding once a year? Is this normal? And is this normal? Um, and is the age and frequency a concern? So it's, uh, it's certainly common among weightlifters. And I'll, I'll reiterate what I said before that I'll always take the exercise over the hemorrhoids. 
um, for people who tend to do a lot of standing weights, such as clean and jerk, lunges, squats with a bar on the back, that, that will increase hemorrhoidal uh, stress. Anything that can be done in the upper body that can be done in a sitting position at, on a bench, for example, in the gym will decrease wear and tear on the hemorrhoids. And of course, you can always back off on your total weights, just reduce the, um, the, the, the um, poundage by 10 to 15 percent. All right, Susie, question for you. Do you like Benafiber and or Sunfiber? I find citrus cell is hard to take taste-wise. Yeah, so citrus cell, you could, you know, if you're just talking about, does come in the caplet forms. Um, slightly more expensive, I want to say, than the powdered form, but um, definitely an option to make it uh, tasteless and more convenient, unless you're talking about the taste of the caplets. And in that case, you know, you might notice that for others too. Um, but Benefiber and Sunfiber, both great products as well. Um, you know, Sunfiber is something that also has um, a, a gelling component to it. Um, and Benefiber can be helpful as a bulking agent. Sort of just depends what, you know, what your issue is, but um, they can be comparable products. So definitely worth a try. Great. So we're running out at the end of, a, uh, running out of time currently, but I would like to end by giving um, all of our panelists the two of you, an option to kind of give your final take home messages uh, regarding any aspect of this, whether it's dietary symptoms, management, treatment, um, anything that comes to mind. Um, we'll do ladies first, uh, Susie. So if you wanna give your final thoughts on, uh, on this issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um... You know, what I mentioned before, very simply, what, what goes in us, most of it, not all of it, but a portion of it is going to come out. And so you can really think about, you know, the texture um, of what you're eating, those different fiber components to try to optimize the stool that you're going to pass and make things easy. Um, and that's for hemorrhoid risk prevention, but also while you have active hemorrhoids. Um, the whole dietitian team at, at NYGA is happy to work with individuals to sort of customize things and investigate what might be going on dietarily. Yeah, that's been one of the major uh, godsend additions to New York Astro Associates, our amazing dietitian panel, registered dietitian. So please avail yourself of their expertise. They're excellent. It's worth it please ask your doctor, how soon can I plug in uh, with their expertise? Uh, Dan, any final thoughts? Uh, sure. I think that uh, like most medical problems, um, common sense goes a long way. I think there are a lot of very good over-the-counter products, dietary and local treatments for hemorrhoids, and they're all worth a short run. But if you find that you're not getting better, don't attempt to treat yourself. There are a lot of possibilities beyond hemorrhoids and seek professional help without suffering for a long period of time. Great. Couldn't have said it better myself, and I will not try to. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening for our conversation about hemorrhoids, getting to the bottom of it. Hopefully you did. And uh, we'd like to see you to continue the conversation at our offices. Please reach out to us uh, our website is nygacares.com, and you can call us at 212-996-6633 to get plugged in with one of our amazing dietitians or gastroenterologists. All right, we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Night.